In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. If you guys remember last week, we said from verses 12 to verse 19, it's talking about uh, fulfillment through wisdom and frustration through foolishness. If you guys remember, the book of Proverbs is constantly comparing two different types of people. One who is wise or righteous or walk on the right path, and one who's foolish, who is wicked. It's, it's a, a very clear distinction between the two. For now, he's talking about the fulfillment that comes to the wise and the frustration that comes to the foolish. He says, poverty and shame will come to him who, is disdains, who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honored. So one of the, one of the signs if somebody is righteous is the fact that he takes in correction. He's willing to listen to instruction. And that's really related to the idea of self-knowledge. When somebody knows themselves, and the self-knowledge allows humility to grow. And once humility grows, they're able to improve and change and repent and adjust. Those who refuse to be corrected, they actually lose themselves. They are stuck where they are. And sometimes when people get older, their ability or willingness to learn becomes reduced. A child is easy to learn and willing to observe everything. But as we get older, we feel like I know everything. So this temptation is harder as people get older, especially when people become steady in their career. Or if they have a career where people at work maybe offer them a tremendous amount of respect, might make them less likely to accept correction. Also, some people have the habit of believing what they hear first. So if somebody comes and tells you something, you believe it. And then when somebody comes to correct it, you're not able to accept the correction. And actually, the habit of believing what you hear first is common to a lot of people. It's not only few. Most people sympathize with what they hear first. Obviously, some people refuse to take accountability for their mistakes. And when they look at their mistakes, they try to find ways to blame everybody else except themselves. Some might take sides in different issues. So the idea of actually accepting correction, it's not easy. And think about it this way. When was the last time you were corrected and you embraced it and applied it in your life? If it doesn't happen constantly, then there's a problem. But he who regards a rebuke will be honored. The person who, who really... When he gets rebuked and he takes it and learns and grows and grows, wow, he will be honored. Honored on earth and honored in heaven. If you guys remember, so this verse says what poverty and shame will come to those who disdain correction. If you guys remember so far in the book of Proverbs, poverty comes for so many reasons. It comes because of laziness, as we saw in chapter 10. It comes because of pleasure and luxury. You will see this in chapter 21. It comes uh, because of uh, to talk instead of getting down to work in chapter 14. Wickedness in general, cruelty, the refusal to listen to instruction like right now, poverty due to moral failure. And, and the book of Proverbs doesn't only talk about poverty in terms of financial poverty, but it talks more about poverty in terms of righteousness, in terms of getting to know God in terms of walking in the light. So this is not only poverty financial, it could be, but it's mainly poverty in the spirit, poverty in hope, poverty in peace. Some people live without hope. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to the fools to depart from evil. That the righteous person will have desires that are satisfied. But the evil will have a hard time departing from what they're doing because they enjoy it. 
I want to tell you guys something important. One of the biggest mistakes when we think about our human being, if I tell you what is the human being, what is deep inside your being? What if I tell you your being is God and you're inside of God? The worst thing that people do is they think of their own feelings and thoughts as their being. What's the problem with that? Your thoughts and your feelings and your motivations change constantly. That is not your being. So the problem is, is that if I am constantly reacting on the shallow, on the surface of my feelings, the desire, they will never be satisfied. I will never be able to depart from the evil. Okay, like fools never find their appetite gratified. Because you're actually living in an area outside your true self. And in the book of Proverbs, by the way, he talks about fools or foolish people. They prefer death over life, destruction to favor, protection to exposure, predation to healing, disgraceful poverty to social dignity. They prefer these things subconsciously because they're constantly reacting on the surface. The righteous person, his desires are satisfied. Remember, the definition of a human being can only be realized in relationship to God. We are a relational being. If there is no God, there is no self. We're lost. So, it's important for us to understand here that he's saying that the people who are righteous, their desires will be satisfied. But the, the, those who are fools cannot depart from evil. It's almost like they become so obsessed with what they're doing that they cannot depart from it. From verses 20 to 25, he talks about the blessed future of a wise son versus the destructive end of the fool. It says, he who walks with a wise man will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. What is wisdom? Wisdom is not sayings, is not books you read. It is a life you live. And a, a critical aspect of that life is your friendship. Your friends will have the greatest impact on you. The famous saying says, what, if you want to be the best, you hang out with the best. If you want to be a, a great monk, the most important decision to do is to find a great spiritual father. If you want to, to be a great scientist, you have to find the greatest PhD professor. And so on. So the friends that I'm constantly surrounding myself with I have, to be, I have to be intentional about that. Because if I am not and I allow it to come and, and just happen organically without making the correct decision, I could truly destroy my life. Many homes were broken because friends of the spouse would give bad advices. They don't fight for people to stay together, but they just care to say whatever words will satisfy the person so they can make them feel happy. St. Macarius said something beautiful. He said, do not befriend any other person except the poor. Do not rush toward anyone for favors, but run to God alone and focus on his service. He is alone. He will hold you in his fatherhood. But for you, watch from favors with people and let your favor only between you and God. A lot of times in relationships, what makes me uh, submit to other person quickly 
is if I keep asking them for favors. If the dynamic of the relationship is not healthy. By the way, a lot of the relationship dynamics, there's always somebody who has a little bit more power. Either by anger, by making people feel guilty, or by personality, or by richness, whatever it is. So sometimes that power dynamic impacts people around significantly. I have to be careful if I'm easily submissive to a person. I have to understand what are the reasons. If you guys remember the story of Samson, Samson was a very strong person. But because of his friends, he made the dumbest mistakes in the world. And you know what's interesting? If we look at our mistakes, we find them very repetitive, just like Samson is. He repeats over and over again. Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous, God, good shall be repaid. Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous, good shall be uh, repaid. Here, the Bible is making evil and righteous almost as a person who are walking after people. And evil does not always mean like uh, misfortune. People might be successful for some time, but overall, it does not lead them to life, eternal life. It might not also lead them to inner joy and inner happiness. But people who live in sin, more evil will catch them. If people live in pride, then selfishness will come, anger will come, greed will come. It's just a cycle. You know, misery loves company. Okay? But those who are righteous shall be repaid. What, it mean, what does that mean? It means, like the Bible said in Matthew 10 to 42, it said, whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water, in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. The smallest thing that we do for the sake of the kingdom is not forgotten. So keep in mind, because the book of Proverbs is very clear, there's no gray area. It's either I'm walking in righteousness or I'm walking in darkness. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Obviously, wealth is, a, is, is considered to be like a favorable circumstances of you being able to help the poor and help those in need. But the Bible says the sinners store up their, their wealth for another person. Think about it this way. People who are good people, they raise their children with good morals and good manners. And the family itself will keep so much wealth. Wealth of traditions, wealth, wealth of love, wealth of pictures, wealth of, wealth of memories, history. There are some families who a family of, of greed and family of selfishness, what happens? Even when they go on vacation, it's miserable. They go to the best place in the world, they're not happy. If we don't sow goodness in our family, everything we make disappears. One or two generations after that. St. John Chrysostom looked at this from a different way. He said, if your mind is good, then the children of your mind are your thoughts. They will produce good thoughts. And this is a, a very powerful analogy because our mind is constantly producing thoughts all day long. The mind does not rest even when you sleep. So there's con constantly thoughts in our head. So if my mind is not fed goodness, 
All what we'll think about is evil. Even if I'm not doing evil, the mind has been corrupted. He says, much food is in the fallow ground of the poor, and for the lack of justice, there is waste. If you guys remember a few chapters ago, he, the Bible made a, a, a difference between a poor man who has a small field but works hard and make it profitable, and the Bible spoke very highly of that person. The Bible also spoke of a lazy person who does not want to work and how this will bring poverty on this person. Here, the Bible talks about something interesting. He says there is actually enough food for everybody. But because of injustice, because of some people do not do their job, the poor are suffering. So the problem is not in God's creation, but it is in our injustice. And that's why in Matthew, the Lord said what? The poor will always be with you. Think about, think about how much have we done to be in a very blessed country like America. We have done nothing. For me, I was home in Egypt. My parents came and said, we got the immigration paper. We're going to go. It was all by lottery, just by luck. Right? We haven't done any efforts, anything. This is important because we cannot forget our responsibility. There are people, people, who would live off literally half of the money is spent on a meal going out for a whole month. There are families over the world, if you send them like $100, for example, that is enough to sustain a family for a full month. But we have to be careful about that because these words are for us. Every person hearing me is rich. Every person in this, in this Bible study is rich. You are the richest 6% in the world. So we have a responsibility. Do not let your life pass us by contributing to injustice. We must take care of the poor. He said, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him discipline him promptly. This is a, a beautiful verse. The concept of the rod is an analogy for chastisement, that you must chastise your child. Take away your phone, give them time out. You have to give reward and punishment. Whatever way you find healthy, to punish or reward them. Because if you don't do this, that means you hate them. It's so easy for us to feel good about ourselves, to give our children everything they want. But learning to discipline the children, it is so important. It is the greatest sign of love. I'm willing to be hurt inside and see my son complain and cry and says, you're a bad dad and all that stuff. For him to learn, for him not to eat too much candy, for example, for him to study, for him not to spend so much time on their phone, whatever it is. Unfortunately, there, there are many parents now, they come to church and the tablet is with their kids all the time. They come to, they go everywhere, they're, they're just basically numbing their kids. They're not learning anything. It's a, it's a problem. Obviously, in a literal sense, there's a difference between a minor uh, sometime holding or, or taking physical interaction with the kids versus abuse. And if your kid is going to put his hand on a fire, you're going to hold him. If he's trying to jump off the stairs, you're going to hold him. Right? There are some physical time where you're going to actually have to intervene. 
and to teach him this is wrong versus abuse. The difference is huge. Abuse, besides it's aggressive and hurts the person, it is a lack of control of my emotion. But a chastisement, it is an intentional plan that the parents have for their kids. It's two different things. And the chastisement is not, is not something I'm responding to at the moment. It's usually a plan I have for my child. Now, the concept here, the Bible gives us a very good, a very important uh, uh, educational tip. He said, uh, but he who loves him, discipline him promptly. And actually, it's part of, it's part even if, if you ever take some management classes, they always teach you this. It's important to give reward right away. Because the best way to receive the same result is by encouraging people. So if I wait too long to, to take care of the situation with the child, especially if they are young, what happens? The impact of the discipline will not make sense. Like my son made a mistake, and then a week later I said, I'm going to take your phone away. It has no meaning. It does not mean anything. The righteous eats to satisfy of his soul, but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. This talks about how the righteous person is satisfied because all his desires are fulfilled. What does the righteous person desire? The righteous person desires that God dwell inside of him. The presence of God. That his eyes, his eyes can see the work of God. And God would show him that. Because the righteous person is somebody who doesn't only pray, but he also does the work and carry the commandments. But the stomach of the wicked shall be always in want. Obviously, the, the, the stomach, the fathers of the church call it the mother of all pains. Because if he cannot control your stomach, you will not be able to control your anger. You are not going to be able to control your mood, your thoughts, nothing. It's the first physical aspect to learning to start walking the journey of self-control. So this is a critical part of my life. If you guys remember the story of the rich uh, man and Lazarus in Luke 16, the, at the end of the story, you see that the, the poor Lazarus was satisfied by the rich, was even in want when he was in hell. Can you come and, and touch my tongue because I, it's hot? Right? Actually, the Mosaic law teaches there is a complete harmony between the food giver and the people as long as they are faithful and their covenant obligation. So what does that mean? The, there is a harmony. Every time I'm eating, as a God, I'm remembering that God provides for me. And if you ever go back to the Jewish dinner, you will see that the Jewish dinner had a tradition where the head of the household will say a prayer and will tell, people, tell the people sitting at the table, let us praise God for the food he has given us. And people will respond, praise be to God. As they are eating, they're remembering that this food was provided to them by God. And it's amazing. You know, like, um, I'm not going to ask you, but every day watching a, a baby grows, it's amazing, amazing how God has a special program in the child. The first words that the child says, for example, mom and dad. Nobody teach him that. We tell him so many words. It's universal. Whether you go to Africa, whether you go to China, whether you go to America, there's a, something inside this child that is God shows I'm giving you, I'm, I'm showing you how I'm providing and how, how I'm working throughout every stage of your life. 
We'll start together chapter 14. Chapter 14 is divided into like three main sections. From verse 1 to verse 7, it's walking in wisdom. From verse 8 to verse 15, is not by sight, not walking by sight, but by faith. And from 15 to 32, contrasting the consequences and characterization of social manner between the wise and the fool. Again, all these topics, they're always presented by comparing the wise and the fool. The wise and the fool. If you guys remember in the prologue in chapter 9, he talked about the role of the husband. Now he's talking about the woman. He says, a wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Look, the woman sets the tone for the culture of the house. The mother is the soul of the house. And actually, uh, if God forbid people ever go through divorce, 99.999% the kids go with the mother. Okay? She has the authority and the ability to build the house. Not by work, but by wisdom. And wisdom for us is God himself. The wise woman builds her house. Throughout history, women were the key educator of their children. And actually in the medieval time, this was one of the ways that they started educating people by educating the women in their homes, the mothers in their home. For having a good wife is not something to take lightly. The rabbis often identified the household with the housewife. You find the example in Ruth 4.11. Let me give you some examples of how we can build or we can how destroy. Some women, for example, when they move from overseas, they become very unthankful. And day and night they complain about how back home is much better than here. They're simply destroying their house. They're creating a house of ingratitude, house of complaining, house of negativity, house of sadness. A mother who does not pray and does not spend time with her kids, but on her phone all day long. I remember one time there was a retreat for the parents, for the family retreat, and they separated the kids and the parents. And the parents complain the kids on their phone all the time. But then the kids complain that their moms are on Facebook and Viber all the time. They don't take a break. Remember, the culture of the house is built by the mother. Some moms might talk bad about their husband or relatives. And instead of fostering an environment of love, they foster an environment of hate. Some mothers, they cannot control their anxiety and constantly yell and scream at the kids. Remember, the kids, 99.9% to go with the mother. The one that has the greatest influence on the kids when they are young is their mother. I remember a while ago, I, I had a survey for the little kids, and I told them, who do you trust the most? And I put mom, dad, uh, the priest, the teacher, Sunday school teacher, and your school teacher. Over 90% said mom. She is the trusted source. Why is she the trusted source? When he's hungry, he runs to mom. When he wants to change his diapers, he runs to mom. When he wants to sleep, he wants, when he does something wrong, he runs to mom. Mom is the protection. The feelings of the mom the child received them so quickly. If she's sad, he's sad. This is nothing to take lightly. Some moms, instead of trying to discover what the plans that God has for children are in their life, they try to dictate it. 
Like my dream is a child become, for example, uh, whatever, a certain career, or has to dress and look in a certain way. Because when she was young, she felt this is the best. Sometimes parents think what they enjoy, their kids will enjoy. I'll tell you a story. A couple of kids came and told me, Abuna, my mom, my parents never take us out on vacation. Fa, you know, I, I don't know the financial situation, so I spoke to the parents, told them, you know what, Yani, even if you take them out a day or two to the beach nearby here, it would be nice. For the mom told me, no, Abuna, we took them to Egypt for three weeks. So I picked up the kids, I called them, told them, didn't you go to Egypt for three weeks? Ali Abuna, I hate Egypt. We go to Egypt for my mom, not for me. Mom enjoys it, I hate it. So sometimes we think what we enjoy, our kids will enjoy. It's not true. Most of the time, it's not true. I have an obligation by wisdom to discover their talents, what they like, and to learn how to sacrifice so we can develop them the way that God intended for them to be. Taban, a wise mother will teach her kids manners, how they eat, how they dress, how they talk. Some of the best mothers you see are the ones that are always smiling. And they teach their kids to be smiley. Long time ago, when I used to live in Philly, there was a father who passed away in a tragic way. He was uh, changing oil for his car in the, park in, in the parking lot. And as he was changing the oil, the car fell on him, so he, he departed. It's a tra tragic story. His wife was in the house at the same time. A day I will never forget. This family has four kids. We all rushed to the house. Her third kid came into the house later. So we met the mom before that kid comes. The moment he walked in, the mom got up, gave him the biggest hug. And she told him, we always say, thank you, God. I was in awe. I was in awe of how somebody can have such a great faith. I'm not going to lie to you. Just in service and ministry, and no offense, mothers tend to have much stronger faith than fathers. Fathers depend so much on their ability and controlling the finances and planning for the future, and they always think things are in their hands. But the mothers, men, they are fighters. Fighters. And we will know this truly in heaven. In the mouth, Verses 2, it says, He who walks in his, in his uprighteousness fears the Lord, but he who preserves his ways despises him. Taban, here he's making a comparison between the different lifestyle. He who walks in uprighteousness fears the Lord. I want to tell you guys something simple. Recently, I was reading a book by a Catholic saint, her name is Saint Teresa of Avila. The book called The Interior Castle. And the concept of the book is that at the center of my soul, God is present and shining. And when I enter the castle of my heart, I will walk through different rooms until I see and enjoy loving God. Now she said the door to this castle 
is prayer, constant prayer. Those who do not pray have not even entered the castle of their heart. Now, after you enter the castle, she said the first door of the room you need to enter is humility, because humility will lead you to self-knowledge, to know yourself. You know what's after humility? This verse. You learn to be in awe of God all the time. Because you enjoy his presence all the time. When I was taking a class um, at Princeton about monasticism, our professor was astonished about how many monks lived alone for many years while maintaining a healthy mental health. Exceptional for monasticism. No TV, no nothing. They live for 40 years in a cave. When they're sick, they pray. When they're tired, they just have to pull through it. They are in the presence of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way. They are walking with God. So beautiful. But he who is preserved in his ways despises him. The one who does not want to walk in a right way, does not want to walk in peace and humility and in love and sacrifice, despise the way of God. One time somebody came and told me, Abuna, don't tell me not to gossip. Because if I don't gossip, what else am I going to talk about? They don't want. They don't want to accept the way of God. Saint John Chrysostom said, "Not just any fear makes people walk straight, but the fear of God. A life provided with virtue is quite illustration, but the addition of fear makes the person more religious." The fear of God is simply the presence of God. If you guys remember in the, in, the, in the story of Daniel the prophet, very righteous man, very righteous man. When he saw the glory of God, what happened? He fainted. His knees were shaking just because he saw the glory of God. In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Obviously, the prideful person, their mouth is like a rod, keeps hitting people left and right, hurting them without even being aware that they're hurting them. In a way, he's his worst enemy because he drives people away from him. Nobody likes to work with somebody who is prideful. No matter how much or how great they are in their career, if they are not humble, people hate it. They run away from it. But the lips of, lips of the wise will preserve him. In contrast to wise people, through their caution, uh, discernment, they protect themselves from needless pain from hurting people and people wanting to hurt them back, from saying things that could destroy people, from doing things that could harm others. The wise person has a self-control. All this, all, this, all this section is talking about what? It's talking about walking in wisdom. So he's using, it's almost like different ideas of wisdom that we have to talk about. He says, where, where no ox are, that rough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. What does he mean by this? This is an example of foolishness and wise. If you want to keep your manger clean, okay, then don't bring any ox. 
the manger will be so clean. But what happens? You will have small harvest. But once you bring the ox and you start plowing, okay, and pulling the wagon, what happens? You're going to have a little bit of mess, but you'll have greater harvest. So what is this saying? It's saying those who decide to do nothing, those who do not want to work, those who are scared to learn, do not want to take some sort of uh, 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 some sort of humility as they're learning. You know, any time you go learn anything, the first part of the learning process is the most humbling. Yeah. So those who do not want to go through that painful experience of being humbled. Their manger will look clean. They won't make mistakes. But they will not have fruits. They will not have plenty of fruits. But those who are willing to go and try and, and learn and humble themselves, and, wow, they'll grow and have experiences and learn and share and, and be like, uh, you said to somebody sometime, they're well rounded about everything in life. How? Because they're probably the most humble people who are willing to be put down and embarrass themselves and all that stuff to learn. I had a, one, of my, one of my good friends became a priest recently. So he told me something interesting. He told me he was invited to give a word at a church by a priest. This priest was almost the father of confession of his elder uncle. Like, you know, you can imagine the gap in age. He told me as he was given the talk, the priest was sitting on the first bench taking notes. And probably, and my friend probably would be like in his 30s, and this priest would probably be in his late 60s. Can you imagine? He even told me, and he, my friend told me I was embarrassed. What new could I tell to a man who has probably 40 years experience in priesthood. This is the spirit of somebody who produces fruit constantly. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Again, remember, we're talking about wisdom, how to walk in wisdom, and one of them is actually to say the truth. In the book of wisdom, Wisdom of Surah says something beautiful. It says, a lying mouth destroys the soul. Some people take lying easily, but what happens to your soul, it is destroyed. It becomes darkness inside. You start not knowing where the truth is. And you start not knowing where you stand, where are your principles. It becomes a problem. The book of Exodus says, you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Obviously, right now, this could work in a legal sense, but also it could work in the way of how we spread rumors and how we talk about other people. If I'm not sure, I have to be very faithful and careful of what I say. Because I could really destroy the image of people and hurt them without knowing. The idea of being faithful and not lying also gives us a picture of the martyrs. Who for the sake of doing what's right, they did not lie. And they were willing to sacrifice their own life for the truth. And obviously a great example of this is St. John the Baptist who lost his life for him to speak the truth to the king. And obviously we live in a time where saying the truth could have some consequences. Verse 6 says, The scoffer seeks wisdom and does not find it, but knowledge is easy to him who understands. Here is the thing. You cannot seek wisdom without practice. It doesn't work. Like some, I was, it was yesterday with the, with the group of the ladies and we're talking about prayer. 
And each person saying, well, you should talk to God as your friend and you should tell him this and this. Another person said, this is the way you should talk to God. And a third person, I told them, God is not waiting for you to say a magic word so he can react. That's just, that's just craziness. God looks at the way of your life. How you practice your life. How you walk in this life. And your heart is what God looks at. What is in your heart? Your motivation. Your intentions. That's what God looks at. So it's not about magic words. So people who belittle their, their brothers, their belittle their own salvation, there is no place of the fear of God inside their hearts. Even when they seek wisdom, they cannot find it. It's not because God does not want to reveal to them their wisdom, but because their attitude in life will belittle whatever they receive. They will step on whatever they receive. In John 5.22, the Lord said, "What If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. God spoke and gave a lot of evidence for the way of righteousness and the way of wisdom and his existence it's even through our own human interaction. It is clear what is right and what's wrong. It's very tough when people reach that point where they cannot find wisdom because their arrogance and pridefulness prevent them from humbling themselves in front of God to understand and receive His words. Let's maybe take one more verse. Go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. Wow. He says here, keep a distance from those people who speak nonsense early on. Because, remember I was telling you there is different dynamics in relationships. And some people who speak foolishness, sometimes they speak with so much courage. He says, be careful, because if you're talking to a foolish man and you're in his presence so much, eventually it will drop off on you. Okay? And this is how, like I told you this before, this is how, like, for example, uh, chains create their brand name, is by exposing people to the chain multiple times. Like for example, if you see like the Starbucks sign, you don't need to know the Starbucks, the little, little mermaid, this is Starbucks. You see the M, this is McDonald's. Why? Because people are exposed to the same thing over and over and over and over again. What you're exposed to constantly will impact your thoughts. There's no question about it. People who are exposed to TV drama and watch so many like Turkish TV or Egyptian TV, what happens, right? They're living all day in drama. <laughs> you find them like, I woke up and I had a dream and I was fighting with my sister and my aunt. And Why? Because what? Because you're constantly watching drama. So this comes with the idea of self-knowledge. When I know that my brain works this way, so what's the best way to feed my brain? St. John, John Cassian said, For indeed a person who loses by daily distraction of mind and lack of self-control what he appears to gain by conversation of other, puts his profit into a bag with a hole. This happens a lot. Somebody takes a nice retreat, reads a nice book, have started to develop this inner discipline with God, then not watch himself or herself, and everything starts going out. And so it is while their fantasy that they can make longer profit by the instruction of others, they are actually deprived of their own improvement. For there, for there are who makes themselves out as rich, though possessing nothing. And there are who are humble themselves, 
aimed great richness. This also, by the way, shows the value of time. I'm sitting with somebody and it's nonsense, wasting of my time. Like uh, Abuna Tadros used to say, when people watch TV, he says, hey, nas ala nas. People are making, making, and you know, people are just fooling others. You're watching a TV series, you know they're fooling you, you know this is not true. But you're enjoying being fooled, sitting and wasting your emotions and feelings and desires and, you know, and think about what's going to happen tomorrow and you can't wait and, you know, like you run back home just to watch the time of the next episode. And it's like people are fooling you, but you like it, I love it. He's saying, why would I allow this foolishness in my life? So these are the instruction of the scripture, and I have to be careful not to take it lightly, because it impacts righteousness versus wickedness, holiness versus a versus evil, and glory be to God forever and ever.